Taking no risk is still taking a risk in this world. That is the world we sadly live in. There is always a risk in everything you do financially. Therefore, you know, saving is good, but investing is better. And the only way you're going to keep up with inflation, if you can handle the attitude to risk, is to invest with all due respect in the stock market. But you have to say to yourself, right, panic solves nothing. And actually, you've had some very good martial artists on. You know, they talk about the martial arts mindset. You know, when you're on the floor and you're being grappled by someone who's probably much stronger and much more technically able than you, your first situation you've got to condition your mind to do is not to panic. You've got to start thinking. And therefore, when you start thinking, you've got to think, what's the right attitude for this situation? What do I need to prepare myself mentally to do? And then you can get your plan together and target your efforts to go and seek help. Yeah. My definition of financial freedom is going into the supermarket and not worrying that the purchase you're going to make um, for your daily groceries or weekly gro shop, you, you, you're not worrying that that money's going to be in your account. You're not worrying that your mortgage is not going to come out at the end of the month. You're not worrying that your bills cannot be paid. Well, if I look at them and as I see, you know, what have you done in your life that's made you so successful? The best people I've seen for diversifying their income run businesses. You seen these? I have not seen these. I saw that someone drew something in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You don't, you don't leave it. You don't it's leave it a digital anymore. link, isn't it? Huh? Digital link. Yeah, it's really cool, man. Impressive. Give a give it a little bash, mate. Oh, crumbs. You got to draw your best deck on there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the expert at this. Oh, actually, I was going to say it's not actually in right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just sort of, yeah, just oh, yeah. Oh, he's, he's gone. For the, he's gone for the penis. Has he gone for? Let's <laughs> have a look. It's, right, a so it's not very detailed, mate. Art was never my forte. That's so much bigger than yours, though, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's not, not, not fucking hard. And it's a bit deformed at the bottom as well. Right. So see that I'm a dick yeah. on a saw. So yeah. like it's a bit deformed. Have you watched? Have you watched Super Bad? Oh yeah. You watch Super Bad when you get some sass drawn dicks. Yeah. So that's literally my life. You got a lunchbox. Before Super Bad as well. You got a lunchbox. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, feels, it feels nicer, doesn't it? To write with. Yeah. It has had. That's actually really impressive. Yeah, it was good. Impressive technology. Yeah. Although with their AI, soon it's just gonna, it's gonna be irrelevant. It's gonna open itself. It's gonna write itself, isn't it? So yeah, uh, yeah. we'll just walk around basically with, yeah, with like a, a notebook, just, just writing everything down that we say. Probably it's like everything. You're gonna ask where that's gonna end. You know, oh mate, what, what, uh, people are just seen Terminator lazy. Too, right? People, yeah, people, 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 gonna gonna become, people are gonna become lazy. Yeah, lazy but, people are people are not going to be able to live the thing, yeah. the thing is we everything will be a challenge but we've already talked loads on this podcast about how important it is for people especially men to have their purpose mm. um and i think it's just going to end up leading to like mass unemployment mm. and i think as a result just people just with no purpose and probably jumping off fucking bridges every day so unless they adapt <sighs> exactly and yeah, how far you, can you go got, before yeah how yeah, much can you it's, adapt it's how far the government let it go i think mm. you know what i mean it's how far they let the ai go you know what I mean? Well, this is where regulation is going to become a key point in the next few years, I think. Well, apparently Elon Musk has been trying to get that moved along for some time, I hear, and it's not yeah, much luck. No, he's not, is he? So now. All right, I think we're on. No, crack on. Uh, so yeah, I'll attend this introduction and then we'll, then we'll go. Good. Happy? Happy, mate. Any final questions? No final questions. Right, so let's see how we get on. All right. Welcome to the. Welcome back to the. No, welcome to. Welcome to, Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today we're talking about financial planning and wealth management during the cost of living crisis. And if you can go from a low income to financial freedom. Today's desk guest is Simon Bennett. Simon is a financial planner, stockbroker and wealth manager. Thanks for coming on, mate. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for having me on, mate. You're welcome. Um, really appreciate you coming on because I think this topic is, wow, well, it's very topical, isn't it? Um, I think everybody's currently aware of the cost of living crisis. It's obviously impacting some more than others. Um, before we get into it, I just wanted to add a little bit of context, um, I think, to the impact that the cost of living crisis is having um, outside of just meaning that people can't buy as much or spend as much money. Um, so Nuffield Health, who are the, the UK's largest healthcare charity, mm. each year do a survey. It's called the Healthier Nation Index. Um, and this year they surveyed 8,000 people in the UK mm. and asked the questions around what has had the, the most significant negative impact on health and wellbeing. Mm -hmm. Now, 46% of people, um, which is a decent number, said it was a lack of physical activity, which is probably no surprise for us, right? Yeah. Mm. 36 said it was uh, a lack of mental health support, but a staggering 63% That's a staggering number. of people surveyed said that the cost of living had the biggest negative significant impact on their health and well-being. 
Mm. So that's, that's a scary thought, but that just adds some context. So I think the, the size of the problem at the moment. Mm. Um, so I guess my question to you, first of all, mate, is can the everyday person improve their financial situation in a cost of living crisis or, or are we all fucked? <laughs> well, I'd like to believe we're not. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm going to say, look, I'm going to say, look, you've got to take everything in the financial world in a quite a pos- with quite a positive attitude. Uh-huh. No one denies that the macroeconomic environment, certainly for the last 10 years, has been an incredibly difficult place to survive for normal people. It's not just the last year where we've seen the cost of living really skyrocket with inflation. You know, we've got to remember we had COVID before that. We've had the effects of Brexit before that. And of course, we came off the back of a credit crisis, which completely changed the whole way we look at financial services and planning Mm -hmm. in this country back in 2008. So for a long time now, the everyday person, be it male or female, has been beaten up for a long period of time. Mm. And there are always things you can do. You have to adjust your attitude to the situation you find yourself in. You have to maintain positivity because, as we all know, maintaining your mental health is the most important – and your health is main, it's the most important thing you can do. So therefore, your financial health plays a big part in that. And therefore, what I hope to talk about today is some tips, tools, resources, and where to find that help so that you can go out there and be positive with your attitude, target your efforts, and then hopefully get the outcome that you're seeking. It's going to be attitude, effort, outcome. That's how it's going to be today. Brilliant. That's good. Mm. There's some reassurance there. There's hope. It's fucking hope. There's always hope. There's always hope. Good. So as you said, I think you're going to very kindly chat us through a a number of different steps, I guess. Uh, Mm. I guess getting started, you mm. know, we're not going to talk about going out and getting a job. We've kind of covered that yeah. already. Mm. But maybe, you know, if you're, in, if you're in employment and you do have some sort of capital or income coming in, mm. um, maybe, you know, how to secure that and then sort of move forward from there in regard to then maybe building your wealth. Mm. Um, before we get into that, though, I guess it'd be good just to hear a little bit about, um, I guess, your credentials and what qualifies mm. you in this particular area. Well, as you've said, Paul, I'm a wealth manager, stockbroker, financial planner, um, authorised and regulated by the FCA. So therefore, I have to say, sadly, that, uh, well, you know, it's part of the game. Everything I say today is more information and guidance for people. Mm -hmm. Everything you do in your financial life, you have to take context and suitability um, for your situation. And therefore, you know, take away what you will from today. But if you need help, with all due respect, there are professionals out there like me who are happy to help you and guide you through the steps of life. Mm -hmm. So everything I should you know, say today should be taken in context of its information, guidance, and shouldn't be taken as advice. And it's important to understand, well, actually understand the regulatory background of, well, the world that I operate in. I'm here to help. But the regulator, frankly, has done a pretty good job in this country of protecting consumers and clients as best as they can. But of course, there's always challenges out there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we'll crack on with how you get started. Yeah. Um, because I think that's the main thing. I mean, a young guy, you know, coming into the working world, no real money to his name. Um, you know, if he's got a support structure around him, great. Not a lot of people do, though. So they've got to think on their feet. And I would say the first stage for them is really getting a job. And I know you've had a lot of good, you know, guys come on and talk on your podcast already about, you know, developing yourself, getting that job, and then developing that job. And I say, as a financial planner, that is key. If you ask me, you know, who my best clients are, who my most favored people to deal with are, are people who know their stuff in their area. You can't know everything, and that's why people like me exist, to help in, you know, areas where, frankly, you you guys are very good PTs, you know your stuff, but equally there'll be areas where you're not so Mm. filled in on. And that's where, you know, we, like I think Jero said on one of his podcasts, you know, we all have coaches for different areas that we need to develop. We all pick up things along the path of life. And therefore, for a young person starting out, I would say, look, listen to those podcasts, think on them, develop yourself as an individual and get yourself a good job, which looks like a good career, well, career progression, pardon me. Mm-hmm. And therefore, that's about attitude. Yeah, That's about getting your mind right, getting yourself settled down to think, actually, where do I want to be? Yeah. You know, listen to those podcasts, think about, you know, targeting your efforts and getting yourself that outcome. That is the best thing you can do to start off. Develop a skill, mm. learn a skill of some kind, a trade, a service, whatever but that then gets you into a job normally where you will have a good earnings Mm -hmm. and the good earnings is where you start doesn't matter really what stage you're at as long as you start off with a good earnings yeah then you can start thinking about right i've got money coming in what's the next stage cash flow positive cash flow 
And you've got to be, frankly, quite disciplined and more disciplined than a lot of people are in our society because everyone likes to spend. Mm. Everyone likes to go out and have the, you know, logo printed clothing. Yeah, um, wrong way, you know, yeah, rainbow horse, mate. Yeah, rainbow yeah. horse, you know, <laughs> red, red logo clothing, you know, and all this fine material stuff. But it's not going to change your environment and give you that peace of mind and that positivity and that path to what we would well what we're talking about today which is financial freedom mm. you've got to be quite disciplined with yourself and therefore getting that positive cash flow for the start yeah and then addressing where your outgoings are yeah so just to find that term positive cash cash flow because I, I think i know what you mean but just mm. for the benefit of the audience what exactly does does that mean income being greater than your outgoings okay yeah of course, and yeah. therefore you look at your bank accounts you look at your direct debits Frankly, and we'll come on to this, you know, you be very careful around credit and debt and loans mm. and things like that. Getting yourself into debt spirals is a very bad start, um, but it's very common these days. I mean, oh, there's some statistics people. around about that and debt spirals and people spiraling into debt, particularly in the cost of living crisis that we're in now yeah. with things like payday loans and etc. This is not good, but there is help out there to guide you out of this if you are falling into it. So therefore, I would encourage you to reach out and get out of it as quickly as possible. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good advice. It was something we talked about on an episode we did uh, a couple of weeks back um, where we talked about kind of doing a bit of a essentially financial audit. Mm. Um, and we I, I likened um, finance to calories mm. and it's just energy balance. But obviously, as you say, it's... it's, it's well, you, you had a very knowledgeable cardiac doctor on saying, you know, check your health. You know, this is the same. You just give, a, just give yourself a little bit of time to check everything to do with your finances. Just take that time on a Friday evening or whatever. Uh, Martin Lewis, the money show, um, money expert, very knowledgeable guy, frankly. Um, you know, he, obviously he's not a regulated individual, but he gives some very good information. And this is something else I'll talk about in a minute, but he gives very good information for people to think about. If you can structure your life such that you're spending an hour in your evening, don't do too much because you'll go you'll start raving mad. Um, but if you can just give yourself an hour to think about your health, to think about your financial well-being, to think about your mental health, then you are doing probably more than most people are at the moment. And therefore, you'll probably see over time your structure and situation improve. It's just a little bit. It's an elephant. It's like eating an elephant-sized meal. All you can do is one mouthful at a time. You know, you're not going to master a lifetime in one day. Yeah. You have to master each day and then you will reach your final goal and outcome. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So... So obviously get an, get an employment if you're not already. Mm. Um, and then maybe in your spare time, try and improve your skill set, improve your knowledge, and then start working up that ladder to try and improve your Absolutely. In incomings. Um, and then obviously maybe do an audit of your outgoings, assess you know where you're spending your money and if you need to be spending that money and try and create a positive balance. You mentioned about sort of debt spirals. Mm. Um, I guess that's a big one at the moment, it feels, isn't it? A lot of people living off credit. It's, it's huge. And I say at the moment, it's you know, years and years ago, I spent a short while working in um, a lending bank. Mm. And even back then, and we're going back probably 15 years, mm. people walking off the street with in, just insane credit card debt, paying the minimum payment and just never getting anywhere with it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean... I almost want to ask what the advice is there. but Well, panic solves nothing, yeah. I think, is the first piece of advice. And a lot of people, the way they bait themselves up is they panic. It's a natural response for all of us as human beings. I think it's a natural response, though, because of the way letters are worded. Mm. Like they're mm. going to end, exactly. you know, like end your existence if you don't pay it within 30 days. Those letters are never helpful either to the yeah. mental health of an individual. But mm. you have to say to yourself, right, panic solves nothing. And actually, you've had some very good martial artists on. You know, they talk about the martial arts mindset. You know, when you're on the floor and you're being grappled by someone who's probably much stronger and much more technically able than you your first situation you've got to condition your mind to do is not to panic you've got to start thinking and therefore when you start thinking you've got to think what's the right attitude for this situation what do i need to prepare myself mentally to do and then you can get your plan together and target your efforts to go and seek help and there is help around there's the citizens advice bureau um, they're a good outfit with all due respect the, for people who are in these situations. They are a guidance uh, giver 
with all due respect, and I'm going to explain. So they're called the Citizens Advice Bureau, but advice is very different to information and guidance. There are three levels that we re- really need to talk about. Information. Information is readily available. You know, YouTube and other search media platforms, you know, they all give information, and that must always be interpreted in context and suitable, you know, made suitable for what you're actually trying to achieve. Then there's guidance, and this is where the Citizens Advice Bureau come in, and they really talk about what are your options. You know, they really, we had a client lady come into us, you know, very modest and all the rest of it, but she'd been to the Citizen Advice Bureau about her pension situation. And she came in with these fantastic handwritten notes, two pages of dense handwritten notes. And they'd given her every option. They'd given her all the guidance possible so she knew all her options. And we just sat down and said to her, so what's your outcome? I have no idea. I'm more confused than when I started because I've got two pages of notes here, but they do not give advice. They will not help you with that outcome. And that, therefore, is for you to take that information away, interpret it to your situation, and if you're still confused by that, seek help. And there is help for people who are spiraling into debt. I know banks are getting a little bit better on this um, with regard to, you know, they have helplines and so on that you can call up to talk to people about this. There are also charities out there for debt. Um, and also mental health charities do a lot on this as well. So I'd, you know, reach out to them as well and can't personally congratulate them because I've seen some of their work. It's very good. Um, but those are the people you really need to reach out to as quickly as possible because if you're in that negative situation, with all due respect, it's a snowball. It's only going to keep getting bigger unless you get the f- – you've got to get out fast. Mm-hmm. And therefore, you've got to deliver – the long-term out, well, you've got to start on that long-term outcome you're seeking, which is this path to financial freedom and, frankly, peace of mind. You're not having that when you're in that situation. Okay. Yeah. Scary situation mm, to scary. find yourself in, I think, isn't it? Yes. And it, it's, it's no wonder that, you know, the statistic that Nuffield's sort of published mm. is that high, I think. Absolutely. With the situation we've seen at the moment, with the macroeconomic environment, people are really feeling squeezed. I mean, the government's giving out inflation figures of 10%. With all due respect... That's based on a basket of goods, which is not necessarily what we would all buy every single day. Uh, When you look at it, a website I like to refer to is Trueflation, a very good website out there, where they look at a basket of goods which is more akin to what we would probably go out and buy every day, you know, food, energy, wise, and et cetera. And they reckon it's more closer to 16 17%. And then if you go into the supermarket and look at the prices a bit closer, I think you'll find it's closer to 19 20%. I saw a statistic the other day. So with those pressures heaping on people now, debt spirals are a very real danger. But this is an opportunity. This is a reality check for people. It's, you know, we live in a good country. Let's not beat ourselves up too much. It's a very good, safe society we live in. There is a lot of help around if you seek it. And therefore, don't panic. Seek the right advice and help and guidance. And then, frankly, go away, interpret it, and action it. And that's the most key point. You've got to action it and go forward. Mm-hmm. When you say uh, action it, do you, do you mean budget? Like yes. budget budget every part of your life? Like would you, would you budget the food bill? There's always a balance, budget? isn't there? You've got to live for today, but also you've got to prepare and hope that there is a tomorrow. You know, some of us aren't always that fortunate, but you've always got to be that optimistic. You've got to be that positive in life. If you, know, if you thought you were going to cop it at the end of the day, you just think, well, yeah, okay, fine. But... We've always got to think there is a tomorrow and you've got to plan for that tomorrow and do the best you can. So it's a trade-off between living for today, but also planning for tomorrow. And that is, you know, you've got to develop that mindset of, yes, I need to get myself a plan together. I need to go through all my, you know, credit card statements and frankly figure out where I am with my debt. I need to look at my bank statements and figure out why my cash flow is not positive. Do I really need this Disney uh, subscription every month? Mm-hmm. You know, do I really get full value out of Netflix with all due respect? Would my time be better spent in the evening going down the gym, working on my physical health, mm-hmm. uh, which might be slacking at the moment because my mental health has been so beaten up. I've been neglecting my body. Maybe I should get health check. Maybe all these things lead into each other. It's just a little bit every so often. You just need to focus back in on yourself and develop your situation. And that's the only piece of guidance that I'd give to anyone in this situation. Seek help. Don't panic. There is help out there and it's good. And then when you get yourself out of that situation, because you've done all the hard yards, well done, by the way, you know, because it can be very difficult. You should be targeting. We have a general rule for the exams we do in my industry. Um, you know, when you get into positive cash flow, how much cash should you really have in your life to sustain your day-to-day living? I mean, there, this was brought about actually and brought home by uh, COVID. 
you know, when the COVID crisis struck and we were all locked down, people were panicking because they were thinking, actually, you know, am I going to stop earning? The government came in and did the right thing, um, put, you know, people on all that, that uh, government uh, sponsorship, basically, uh, building up a debt for the country. But it needed to be done. It needed to be done. Because otherwise people would panic. People would not be able to afford to live day to day. Um, yes, we've saddled ourselves with a debt as a society for later down the line, but it needed to be done. So that's the price we paid. But, you know, going forward with that, it taught us a lesson. How much cash do you need to survive day to day? General rule, three, six, nine months. Think that sort of period. If your job stopped tomorrow for whatever reason, health, well-being, you got fired, could you survive for three, six, nine months? on the cash that you have right now available to you liquid. Yeah. See, that's such a hard thing to do though, mm. on someone who's on 25,000 a year, mm. yeah. especially now with that inflation. Is, that's that's where the issue is, isn't it? That is like, it. That's the attitude that you've got to have though. You've got to look at your situation and go, that's my target. Yeah. If I can get myself into that situation, it might take you a long time, but if I can get myself into that situation of having three, six, nine months cash flow readily available, I'm in a very strong position because if anything happens to me or anything happens to my family, I've got breathing space. I've got more peace of mind in that situation. I'm not going to be beating myself up mentally and hell, probably health-wise, trying to run around, scrapple, and do everything else. You're buying yourself time and space, and that is very important when it comes to you know developing your financial plan. You know because then you know you've got positive cash flow. What's the next stage? You know we can move on from there. Yeah, I think you made a. a comment then about it might take some time and i think that's the mm. important thing to realize and especially you know we've probably talked about this already with some of the younger generations now who just want immediate gratification mm. yeah and i think the reality is what simon's talking about might be it could be like a three-year plan five-year plan mm. it might take you some time to get to that point right we are all a product of the world that we presently live in right now which is social media you know we've got phones which are constantly bombarding us with you know successful people you know who are, <laughs> oh yeah i did this and i made loads of money on this and whatever we're constantly bombarded with instant gratification but with all due respect you've got to hark back to you know if you've had any good role models in your life of the older generation they took years to do this and with all due respect rome was never built in a day you have to condition again your attitude and your mindset as part of your plan to go look this is going to be a slow process but it's going to be a good process life is a challenge and i'm ready to meet that challenge and that's where you need to take that attitude and then point your efforts get your outcome and stay focused on your outcome yeah no i completely agree it's like all the things that we've been talking about on, it's the on same with training well. yeah i mean yeah. obviously we talked to mark about doing the financial audit, which we've already talked about, mm, yeah. you know, sort of controlling your outgoings, finding that right energy balance with the cash, mm. maybe reducing some of your outgoings, maybe thinking about, can I take some overtime? Mm. Can I get a second job? Oh. Um, it's all these things. And then you just, you know. You, you know, you've got to balance all these things. You know, it's like going into the gym. You can build up some consistency. What you don't want to do is build up that consistency and then suddenly stop. It's like the guy who comes into the gym, builds himself up to a 200 kilo squat, goes away for six months, probably, you know, has something happens in his life or whatever, comes back in. Oh, it's only 200 kilos, gets absolutely pretzled. Mm. You know, <laughs> we've all seen those people, you know, it's just. Yeah, it's probably you, been me once or twice to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's the slow, consistent, yeah. you know, work on yourself. But mm. don't beat yourself up. Don't panic. You know, it's that martial arts mindset of, you know, life seldom comes for you when you when the sun is shining and you're walking down the street and everything's good. Life will come for you when, frankly, you're broken, you're hurt, and things aren't going so well for you. And that is especially true financially. Uh, so, therefore, you need to start building good habits, get your plan together with your attitude, and just settle your, settle your mind and go, this is going to take me some time. Because I, I, you know, I've enjoyed myself. I've had great bank holiday weekends out with uh, with my all my friends, and uh, I've spent like Beckham and all these other terms that could come to mind. But now I've got to put some hard yards in and develop myself as a person and develop my situation. Yeah, yeah, it, it is totally like a weight loss journey, isn't it? It's the same thing, mm. like little, little, little step by step, little bits, make little sacrifices, work a little bit harder, mm. and, and stay and stay consistent. Mm. People have got to be willing to yeah. stay in instead of going out, and they've got to be willing to not buy the nice t-shirts yeah. when their friends are buying the nice t-shirts. Big one that I find that people trap themselves in is like car repayments things like that you know Car they, payments they, material things and this is the they difference. seem to get this yeah they seem to get this thing where they've got so much outgoings because to keep up with the joneses to to i've been guilty of that you know i've had 
two cars on finance before and financially I could pay for it, but at times it would cripple me because if I had one bad month in my old business or two bad months, I was like, oh God, I've still got to find, you know, five, six, 700 pound a month just on my car payments without my petrol, without all my other bits and pieces. And Absolutely. then once I shifted that, I don't have as nice of a car now, but really my life's not changed. The only thing that's changed is that I'm not shitting myself every month thinking I've got to find, exactly. make sure I find this five, 600 pound. And I think, especially as you grow up a little bit, that that your shift changes in your mentality. When I was 25, and I'm only 33 now, but my shift in mentality has changed a lot, where when I was 25, I was like, yeah, I'm doing well, so I want to show people I'm doing well by having a nice fucking car, you know? But then when you're 33 now, I don't give a shit. You know, I I, I wouldn't care what I drove to That's work your priorities changing yeah. as you're developing. For that guy who's starting off with himself, 20 years old, yeah, you've got to get out there, you know, you've got to make your state your claim. Yeah. But you've got to also think, actually... And what I'm saying. I wish I could it. tell my 25 well, year old self that. This is though, it, you know, know what I mean? I wish we watch this. Go and work there. on yourself and, you know, make sure what you're selling out there, because you're putting out a big bravado, make sure what you're selling, your skill set, is as good as you're saying it is. Yeah. You know, do you walk the walk? I think everyone does it, though. And that's, that's the focus sort of for the guy getting You know going. what I mean? They're still living at, what I find is people are still living at home, hmm. but then they've got a £40,000 car. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's not. They're not. They're not doing it in the right way, and I think we need more information from people like you. That's the delusions of society and the society we live in, though, with this instant yeah, gratification, because yeah. it's all a facade. It's all an image. And with all due respect, you try that with your financials; they're going to come and bite you, yeah. and then that is going to affect your mental health. That's going to affect your health. It's going to snowball, mm -hmm. and therefore you have to sit down with yourself and think: Is my attitude correct for what I really want to do here? Where do I want to be? Mm -hmm. What am I about? Um, so you need to sit down and it's right you mature you realise what's important in life but sadly you can't tell your 20 year old self that yeah you, you know, just, you with just, you just can't have a dick <laughs> yeah. you know? but you know you can guide any friends you have who are that age and just say look you know you're a solid guy and all the rest of it you're doing an apprenticeship that's great you know, or you're doing your services degrees and all the rest of it you're getting yourself well trained up this is a great start get yourself a job get yourself an income work your way you know, in that job to being, you know, known as good mm. and then develop yourself, but also develop yourself in other ways as well. You know, Don't just focus on You know that. when you were talking about the start of people's journeys, mm. how important is it to save or try and get family help to get the money for a deposit for a mortgage compared to going into renting with the price of rentals going through the roof like they have? Rentals at the moment are going through the roof and we are frankly finding a lot of policy coming out of the government um, which is taxing landlords harder and therefore they're obviously going to pass on those costs um, but that is more to do with a societal change people do need to rent at some point in life i rented you know when you go away to university you're only in a certain place for a certain period of time i mean therefore what you've got to take is the view that i'm in education i'm here to work and study but i'm also here to enjoy myself like we all yeah. did um, but you know with all due respect you know there is a target at the end of this Yes, I'm going to rent. Yes, it's going to be expensive. I need to watch my costs. I need to learn cash flow. This is a good time to learn cash flow when you go away to university and people have to and it's forced upon them. And we've all seen how that can turn out sometimes. But, you know, when you come out of university, you secure that job, you secure that income. You look at your cash flow, get it positive, because then what you need to do with all respect is you need to go and have a chat with a mortgage advisor. And I would recommend if you're thinking, you know, if your job's going well and you've built up some good cash flow, positive cash flow, you've got yourself really tidied away, you've dug yourself out of any potential debt spirals you may have been in um, and you're getting yourself into a situation where you're thinking you know what I'm really tired of renting it's it's you know I'm paying money to someone else I'd much rather pay that money in someone my, to myself now I think I, I'm you know really cracking on with my job I've got a promotion lined up and all the rest of it go and talk to a mortgage advisor see what they can do for you at the point when we're releasing this um, it should be noticed that interest rates have just had a massive hike uh, one of the fastest hikes, I think, actually in many decades. Uh, I can get the exact data, but... Um, when, when was this? Like, what, today, tomorrow? Well, no, this is over the last year. The Bank of England interest rate has been is now at 4.5%, mm. and therefore mortgage rates are well over 5 uh, for most people. <laughs> crazy. And this is going to cause this next crisis. This is why people need to start focusing their attitudes on, you know, where are we with our financial situation? People need to do a financial health check. They need to listen to people like the prompts and information that comes out of the likes of Martin Lewis. He's on every week, and this week he was on saying to people, you know, do a check to see if you're due with all due respect, any help from the government on the universal credit scheme. Because if you're earning less than 60,000 pounds, it's worth a check. 
you know, to see if you're due, you know, tight. That's 60,000 pounds as a couple or well, as like I believe, a I believe that's as an individual, but, you know, they if you put it into the system, the system will assess you. And if you're not doing anything, that's fine. You know, you've done the check. You've done the check that you can do. But at the same time, you know, you should do that check. And this is where he comes in quite useful because he comes up with bits of information that prompt you to look at your situation and how you're, you know, addressing your plan. And then you can target your efforts and just think, oh, actually this week, I'm going to have a look at that. Because maybe I've got, you know, a young family or whatever. Am I getting my child tax credits? Am I getting my pension credits or, you know, for my nan or whatever? And, you know, just do a review of your situation. It's a good idea to do. It's like you review your health. It's like you review your training. You just need to keep chipping away at it. Um, but, yeah, that's basically where we're at. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, we, we've used the term financial freedom mm. on a couple of occasions. I mentioned it, obviously, in the intro. You just mentioned it a second ago. Mm. Just again, just looking to define some terms for people. What, what, what's your definition of financial freedom? My definition of financial freedom is going into the supermarket and not worrying that the purchase you're going to make uh, for your daily groceries or weekly gro- shop, you, you, you're not worrying that that money's going to be in your account. You're not worrying that your mortgage is not going to come out at the end of the month. You're not worrying that your bills cannot be paid, that your car you know, cannot be paid for. You have not got that worry. You have got that peace of mind that you have got positive cash flow in your life generally, whatever stage of life you're at, that these things are not a worry for you. You know you are in a solid position. Frankly, sadly, much more than most people at the Mm. moment because so many people have been squeezed. Yeah. But that's, to me, what financial freedom represents. It's peace of mind. It's the process towards peace of mind. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Right. So, that's that's I guess jump forward the journey a little bit. So we've, you know, so we're maybe now thinking about someone who's maybe in their sort of a bit older. Yeah. You know, they've they've done well at work. They're in a positive cash flow situation. We talked about the lad who's getting started. And now I think we've talked about the guy who's now probably what you know, put down put, put down a deposit for a house. Probably looking at getting married. Yeah. Probably looking at having children. Yeah. So so yeah, the 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 guy who's maybe got you know mm. a few you know three to six months sort of liquid cash available mm. should Done well. know, any shit hit any fans mm. um yeah i guess from that point so you know you're, you're comfortable mm. you're kind of financially free to to the turn or the definition that you've just used where you you know you're okay but i actually want to grow my wealth now i want to improve my situation even more and yeah. i guess you know use maybe the the definition of financial freedom to the to the extent where you know you can maybe if you were to be unemployed for a period you haven't got to worry or mm. You, you know, you can change jobs and not worry um, and maybe make the bigger purchases and not worry. Well, I think, so the next stage for us, we talk in financial planning about trigger points in mm. life. There are key points in your life where you frankly need to sit back and go, actually, I need to review what I'm doing here. And I would say this next stage is a trigger point for you because it's, things are going to change. And therefore, you need to think about, you know, checking your earnings, um, checking your cash flow and tax positions, uh, because you're, you know, you're probably earning quite well at this point. You've got positive cash flow. Everything's going well. It might be worth you just seeking some tax advice just to check your tax position as appropriate, uh, that you're not paying more tax than, frankly, you need to legally. Um, You know, check your career position. Are you due a promotion? Are things really going well for you? You know, check yourself is the bottom line here. And then also you've got to come on to the next stage, which is, you know, you're going to be thinking about that bigger house for the family. You better check your credit score. You better check, you know, because there's a service from Experian out there. It's free. You can go on Experian, check your credit score, see where you're standing. And then, frankly, the next bit on their service is the paid service. If you think there's any inaccuracies there or problems, address those because that will assist you with the next stage. And then what you're talking about then with your positive cash flow and you're earning good money is saving. And I like to say investing because there's a saying out there that poor people save, rich people invest. And what that means is that generally putting money away is always a good thing. But what you want that money to do is work harder for you. And therefore what you want to really do is invest in assets. And the biggest asset you're always going to have is yourself. So you should always invest in developing yourself, developing your skill set. That's the first given. The next part is you should look at building up you know, suitable portfolios for yourself that give you that second level reserve that should anything ever happen, that you know your emergency fund, as we call it, you know, three, six, nine months of cash that you've got sitting around ready to go for you know, those everyday things. You prang the car, you know, someone needs to repair a part of the house. That covers that. You've got your second level reserve that you can then build up tax efficiently. And this is the key point that will assist with any large lumps of capital that you might need to really push forward. And the best way to do that for people of our generation at the moment is ISIS. 
Um, and when I say ISAs, I don't mean cash ISAs. Because um, while we've talked about the Bank of England raising interest rates, and we are seeing some better rates coming out of the banks at the moment, you've got to think with your attitude more long term, because that is your path to financial freedom. That is your path to peace of mind. You've got to think, yeah, I could buy a cash ISA today, but um, and it might be paying 3 4%. Okay, that's suitable for my attitude to risk. I'm not a risky person. Fine, not a problem. All I'd say to you is you're taking a risk because with inflation at 10%, 16%, 20%, if you're buying food, if food's your main expense, you're losing buying power of your money every year based on the difference between that and inflation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you need to think about that. Taking no risk is still taking a risk in this world. That is the world we sadly live in. There is always a risk in everything you do financially. Therefore, you know, saving is good, but investing is better. And the only way you're going to keep up with inflation, if you can handle the attitude to risk, is to invest with all respect in the stock market. And that's where obviously I major for my clients. So for people who don't know, what's an ISA? Oh, an individual savings account. It's an account, well, it's a wrapper. We call it a wrapper. Just think about it like a bucket that you can open with most major banks, building societies. There's two types. There's a cash ISA. Well, actually, there's more than two types, but we'll talk about the basics. The cash ISA, mm -hmm. and there's also a stocks and shares ISA. We like the stocks and shares ISA. For, I've talked about the cash ISA, you know, fixed rate, but you need to think about... So that's about, like your 3-4% yeah, that you get back but you need to you, you, you need to think about, yes, that's you know what people regard as minimal risk. Um, but, you know, again, we've spoken about risk. We've talked about inflation. we talked about how you would erode your money over the longer period if you leave your money there. If you can... If your attitude to risk is suitable and your other situation in context is suitable, it is a good idea for people of our generation to look at stocks and shares ISA. And it is a good idea to look at building yourself a portfolio there over time with your, you know, extra money that you can then invest for the longer term. And that is a very good way of complementing your future plan. So who, when you put it into the stocks and shares ISA, hmm. who is investing that money, the bank? Well, you can do it. Uh, there are people who do their own investment portfolios. I would caution most people against that with all due respect, because obviously I've seen some proper horror stories. Um, you know, people don't know the risk of the stocks and shares they're investing in. They think that because they can read a bit of information on Google, they're suddenly becoming investment gurus like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Um, I'm afraid seldom is that ever true. They are normally taking a lot more risk than they actually understand. And therefore, in life and the world that we presently live in, I would say to you, why are you taking that risk? You know, there is always other things in life you could take that risk with, you know, developing yourself, going for that promotion. You know, I would say don't take that risk with your money, personally. Uh, I would say keep it straight down the line. Always keep it regulated, by the way, and this is a very key point. Always look at everywhere you put your money. Look for the FSCS accreditation, uh, financial services, uh, you know, FCA accreditation, because that means your money is held in an account where, frankly, regulation, UK regulation, will do give you some protection. And that is very important. This is your money. This is your future. And therefore, I would say, look, individual savings account, invest that money. And if you can't do it yourself, there are model portfolios often run by banks, building societies, and other outfits that are out there that you can look up on YouTube, Google, etc. Make sure they're FCA regulated again. But you know, you can open an ISA account with them. They have model portfolios, which you can say, what is your attitude to risk? Is it low, medium, or aggressive? And you can tailor it to yourself. And then if you don't like it, you can always pull your money out, or you can transfer it to another ISA. And that is the key part, I think, for our generation. If you've got spare money, if you're doing all the right things, and you've got that spare money, that is a good place to build up a good second level reserve for yourself. Because what you need to remember as well is if you have a good job these days, you're already doing some saving. You've got auto enrollment. Is that the sort of thing that you just put like monthly into? Yeah. If that makes sense. So yeah. You know, your ISA, if you, you look you at your go, oh, I've got this, I've got five hundred pounds a month that I'm not really doing anything with. You put it into the the stocks and shares ISA hmm. and from there, the only thing I don't quite understand is you saying transfer it to another... Well, that's if you feel that that ISA is not performing for you.
Yeah, so that so there's a specific one for a sp- specific bank, if that yeah. makes sense. And then you know each bank might do it slightly different with a yeah. different portfolio. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Yes, they yeah. Might, they will they, there will be different managers for each one of these model portfolios because ah, right. either you can invest and, in they, and they decide yeah. on what they invest in basically. Yes, and they will they will have little PDF spreadsheets mm-hmm. that you can download, and they will give you maybe some video uh, spiel on a YouTube channel yeah. about you know this is how we see the market at the moment, and therefore this is how we're positioning this portfolio that you can invest in with us. Um, there is a lot more of that going on with financial institutions now, which is great information for you if you're thinking about going down this path. And I'd urge you to do your research, of course, before you ever part with any of your money in any of their directions and make sure they're FCA accredited again. Um, but equally, yeah, you could manage it yourself. Some people do. Some people like to have a bit of a go on the stocks and shares market. But, yeah. you know, you've got to be careful you're not getting into gambling. There are three uh, types of people must be addictive. Well, <laughs> this is it. People, it. people really get into this I, stuff. I might have been guilty of this. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we talk about three different types of people, really. When you know you do my job, you talk about the gamblers. You know, they're the people who will you know, bet on the horse racing like a stock. Everyone likes a stock when it's winning. Mm-hmm. Everyone likes a winner. They won't tell you about their losers, though. Then you've got the speculators who are in the middle. They like a bit of a gamble, but equally they like to think they're semi-serious. With all due respect, okay, fine. Then you've got the investors. Those are people who take the longer term view. They buy quality. And buying quality with your money is probably one of the most important things you can ever do with it. Um, We've all seen people go and buy fly by night companies. I mean, the biggest one we've seen recently is Tesla. Uh, People thought this was, you know, the next huge thing, and it was for a while. Uh, And then the whole, the whole, electric car industry i think wasn't it Mm. i mean i think there's still a lot you know there's still a lot to be said for it but at the same time most of that was forced forward by speculation in the market a lot of people buying it because hey everyone's buying it the postman's buying it i mean there's a general rule when you hear the postman talking about it it's probably too late Mm. you know when he's when you hear the postman talking about a stock probably a bit too late then therefore you need to think you know is this appropriate am i taking the right level of risk with my money here maybe i should step back maybe i should think Think again. Maybe I should seek some advice because I'm building up quite a good nest egg here. Mm. That is the period when you think to yourself, could I afford to lose this money? What difference would this make to my lifestyle if I lost this money? Yeah. And frankly, you want to avoid that situation, obviously. Yeah. With the um, with the investment ISIS, one that I've used before was through Money Moneybox. Yeah. Um, and that worked in a way where you could attach that to your bank account and it would do the roundups of your spending. Yeah, it's like Plum. Is there a place called Plum? Mm. Something? Yeah. Something There's like a few of these now running through where you can yeah. basically round up your spending and keep topping it up. And this is a good thing to do because if you know you've got positive cash flow, if you know you've got excess cash, which you know you're not going to do anything with in your bank account, maybe you've got a savings account attached to your bank account where you keep a bit more money and it's earning a little bit of interest. But then you know you've got the rest of that money. It's going into your ISA. It's working harder, hopefully, for you under professional management. And the other thing you need to really look at when you open these accounts is cost because they will charge you. No one does anything in, in this life, sadly, for free. We all have to earn a living, though, at the same, you know, at the opposite end of the spectrum. So, therefore, you need to look at cost. Cost is very important. You need to look at the fund charges, and you also need to look at their annual management charge and in, if there is any a setup charges. So, that all that literature should be made available to you, and you should just digest that and just think, actually, am I going to see that level of value from what they're doing here? And also, when you look at their charts, because they'll give you their past performance, past performance is never a reflection of future performance. You need to look at the quality of the manager who's managing the money. That's what I'd say. When you employ someone like me, yes, you can look at the track record, but you've also got to get a feel for, you know, have they done the academic hard yards? Are they, you know, really set up for, you know, what I want to, what do they really get on with me? But also, are they really going forward positioned in a way that I think is sensible? So you need to consider all those things. There's a lot to consider. But if you're into that world, you will learn with time. And there's a lot of good managers out there giving a lot of good products like that. So Mm -hmm. it's worth considering when you're in that situation. I was going to ask that there's another ISA that we've not talked about, which is the Lifetime ISA. Yes, the Lifetime ISA. Is that still something that you value these days? That is a very good ISA, actually, for the chap who's probably getting started, probably at university. If he's fortunate, his parents may have a bit of extra money to give him. Um, But that is more used to an individual at that stage because they may be saving for a deposit for a house, like you've spoken about, Danny. And that is where that one comes into it because, you know, you obviously talk to your conveyancing solicitor. They can get you a 25% uplift. 
Um, I believe that's still the thing. You know, we can check the figures on that. But that is the situation with the lifetime ISA. You can't put as much into that type of ISA as you can with the others, yeah. of course. And that, you know, is subject to the rules of the time. Um, but they are a very good tool at the moment for people who could be using those for deposit for house purchases. I mean, especially if you, sorry, it more applies if you're buying a new build property. And there are a lot of new builds going up around the uh, place at the moment. Yeah, because so I guess there's... there's that's, it's a very good question because it's a very good point. You know, it's, yeah, I guess there's it's a, useful for people. Because I think the first thing, I, I, I've, I've got one, but you yeah. have to be under 40 to open one first of all. I think it's 39 is the cutoff. Hmm. Um, and then to your point then, you can only get the money out. So you get like a 25% uplift on everything you put in. Yeah. But it's for first time buyers. Yeah, or pension, right? Hmm. So, oh. but, so I think you can pull it out for a pension when you retire or when you buy. But if you try and take it out before, you get penalised and essentially lose money. That's to do with the interest um, lock-in that you've agreed with the product provider. They will have terms. It's like most of these banks now with their savings account. If you save £250 a month, you get a certain interest rate. But if you pull it out, you lose a certain amount of interest. Those are always things to consider when you're looking at your plan and where you are with it and where you're actually investing or saving your money. Um, how so, does um, how does something like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? I, um, how does that like affect savings and stuff? Right. Did that affect all that, or did it? Do you know what I mean? So very the, the official company. line I have to give you as a regulated, authorized, and regulated financial planner, I would t tell all of my clients, and I flatly tell them, stay away from anything that's unregulated. Yeah. You do not need to take that risk. And also, I have a personal view, obviously, on. Bitcoin and crypto and all the rest of it that I can give you. Look, it's done fantastically well for some people and some people got very lucky. But I take the view that it was actually just that. Mm. Just lucky, yeah. Yeah. I mean, with, you know, banks, central banks are now cluing onto this. And we saw Rishi the other day on one of his releases talking about releasing the UK's digital currency. So when, frankly, all of our countries catch up with releasing their own digital you know, currencies, what's going to be left for these guys? Yeah. And what are you going to be able to buy for that? I can't go buy down and buy my family milk, sugar, bread, you know, all the things you know, we might need for our day-to-day -day living. You can't actually use that stuff. So everyone's catching up. And therefore, I would just say, look, adjust your risk attitude. Yeah. You know, think about where you are, where you want to be. Think about your attitude. Think about where you can target your efforts and think about your outcome. Does it fit? It's an unregulated investment yeah, yeah i thought i'd just ask because asset. you see it fucking everywhere then you're oh, oh yeah invest in crypto invest in this Bitcoin, is the, invest this, in this is the danger of the world we live in isn't and that's it? what i was going to say like how did how does you know from a professional seeing mm. it who he do, deals with money all the time what, mm. you know what was your view on it well and, uh, yeah. yeah that was all these instagram people shoving it down our throats yeah, on social I mean, media yeah. we are bombarded by this stuff every day and it's very dangerous because people will always seek the easy option and they see it as the easy option, but it's very dangerous. You need to maintain your discipline and think, actually, is my attitude right here? No, I don't think it is. Mm. You know, it's unregulated. If you lose your money, can you afford to lose your money? If you can't, or, you, or, or if it's going to be distasteful for you. When I you say it's unregulated, does that mean that it could just do anything? Like there's it no, could do anything. Someone could steal your money. There's no protection. There's no protection. Well, was it, wasn't there a, um, like a, a crypto bank or wallet or something that just pretty much vanished recently and just yeah, there's been billions a few, with it. There have been a few cryptocurrencies. Oh, yeah, I think that, I read that. FTX yeah. or something? Something mm. like that, yeah. Just. There have been a few along the way that, um, frankly, they reckon the CEOs or whoever's been involved has just sort of banked the money and just disappeared. Been they, they, and they've done it with celebrities as well, endorsing yeah. their, their currency, yeah. and then they've took, taken, like, billions. Well, Kim Kardashian, boom, Kim Kardashian got a huge fine for, um, I think, Pump and Dump, yeah. where she awesome. used her influence to pump up the value of a crypto coin. And then sold it. Yeah, and, and then sold they sold it and just everyone lost their but money. But this is it. You're a pawn in that financial game where they know there's no comeback on them because it's completely unregulated. Yeah. There are no protections for you as an investor. And therefore, I would say to you, look, you're not earning the sort of monies that these people are on. You haven't got the sort of backstops. Be sensible, adjust your goals, adjust your outcomes, and focus on those. Because, yeah. you know, it's like our grandparents' generation. They couldn't, if they couldn't afford something, they didn't do it. My granddad always says that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's always like, if you can't afford cloth, something, boy, cut your cloth. I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's the old oh, lessons. And that's what people have forgotten in a world where we want instant gratification and we search for it so hard that it damages our mental health and then it damages our health and it has that knock on effect. Yeah. And that's what we see um, from the professional side. And we just say to people, look, let's get back to the core. What are you really focusing on and for an outcome here? Let's build from that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a mad one. I think the crypto stuff.
But yeah. I think Logan Paul was the same, wasn't he? Did the Crypto Zoo? Have you heard of that fucking yeah, bollocks? Yeah, fucking it's <laughs> N- NFTs and all that yeah, shit. And nonsense. it's just it, it just it just seems the, like a the big next scam, the next scam, the next fad. But you've got no comeback. Yeah, no comeback it, at all. It sounds like as you as you said, then I think if you've got enough money that you you, you want to have a little gamble, then maybe yeah, that's it's your money like at the end pun. of the day. If you want to do that. Absolutely fine, but don't. You could come... effectively still do that under regulation, couldn't you? And something like you said, with a well, people like a, people like can do all these I, people I can do all these things, but it's just down to where the buck stops when it all goes wrong. Yeah, are you prepared for that? Yeah. Can you handle it? Can you handle turning around to your family or your wife and saying, lost "50,000"? Yeah, with all due respect, I've just lost fifty thousand pounds. Well, why? Have you had things like that? <laughs> Have you had stuff like that? Uh, yeah, had, like yeah, we, we we've heard. We, we, I can't talk too much detail, but I've had some people. We've dealt with some people who have lost some money. And they've been very quiet about it. And then eventually, you know, because we have that relationship with our clients, they eventually let it slip that, oh, yeah, I should have come to you with this, this, and this. And that's what I said I was going to do. The reason I didn't is because I did this. And we just say, okay, you know, fine. Because of what we're doing for you, your plan is still strong. You could technically afford your, your capacity for loss, as we call it, was good enough to take that hit. But at the same time, you idiot! Why did you? Ne- <laughs> why did you do that? You know that yeah. that would look far better on a holiday for your family. You know, doing something you know far more productive, wouldn't it? Yeah, so it you just got to weigh up that, and that's decisions in life. Yeah. Um, so I would just say, look, risk is a individual thing. Risk is and context. You know, you always need to see where you're at and what you're comfortable with in life. It's the same with anything, training, anything. What are you comfortable with? And therefore, build from there. Mm. Don't take any unnecessary risks. The world is a risky enough place. It's a volatile enough place at the moment as well, as we've all seen. You know, we don't need to do too much without seeing a lot of volatility. Definitely. Um, with the investment ISAs um, and investing in general, so I think, you know, over the certainly during the pandemic, most of the market is, is gone down. Mm. Um, I think, you know, for people that are maybe doing sort of short-term trading, they can they can kind of bet either way, can't they? So about it going up or down, and that's a different game, I think. This is where I get into a debate with people because people think about what I do, um, both as a stockbroker and an investment manager. I'm actually dual qualified. So the financial planning to me is about getting your money in the right places, getting your structure right. It's like with you guys with PT. You build your structure first, and then you build on that. But When you say your structure, though, what do you mean by that? Because getting your money in the right places. You know, so like planning it, so being like, right, these are all my bills. I've got seven hundred pounds left a month. Mm-hmm. What do I do with that seven hundred? Exactly. Do you, do you then say, right, okay, I've got this X amount for leisure, this yep. X amount for savings, yep. and, and then be really rigid. And then about another it, yeah. topic we'll talk about in a minute: protection, um, which I think is a very important thing for people at our stage, um, but is chronically undersold in this country and chronically underused by people of our generation, um, and something we'll come on to in a minute. Um, but yeah, that is. What, the fi- what financial planning is. It's getting your ducks. If you can present yourself a plan on a single sheet of paper where you know all your financial assets inside and out, you are doing very well. You don't simplify your plan, get it on a piece of paper, go, that's doing well, that's not doing well, put it down, I can go on with life. Okay, I know what I need to do. I can target my efforts because I've adjusted my mental attitude. I can now target my efforts towards my outcome. And that's where, frankly, financial planning comes in. The other side of my job is going, right, you've put your money in the right places. You've got an ISA. Um, so where is that invested? You know, what is the, you know, you go into the nitty gritty of, is that appropriate for your attitude to risk, your capacity for loss? Are you, are you aware of the risk that you're taking in your investment portfolio? And this is where the second part of my job really comes in. We dive straight into that bucket and we can help people really structure an investment portfolio that is far more suitable and akin to them. And also another thing that's come up more recently is ethical investing. People do not want their money being used for things that they deem you know, unethical. We've had environmental, social and governance coming, being thrown at my industry, particularly recently. And it's a real part of our industry that's picking up a lot of steam at the moment. Obviously, it's uh, had its uh, hood pull, pulled over in the last year or so with what's happened in Ukraine, etc. But that is the future of investing. People are far more conscious about the companies that they're investing and who, well, what their money is actually doing. Is it doing good in the world? 
Hasn't so. there been a lot of things about co- is it cobalt? Cobalt? Yeah, mining? cobalt mining. Yeah. You know, with like Apple and things like that. And Tesla, Using yeah. Tesla, yeah, yeah. And people want to know that when they're investing in these companies, that they have the environmental background, they have an environmental you know, strategy. They have social uh, strategy, so they, you know, when they go into um, different towns and all the rest of it, they try and in- integrate themselves and they try and support the local communities that they're in. But also their governance. And with all due respect, you could argue if you were investing in stocks in the past and you weren't looking at a company's governance, you probably weren't doing your job properly, because the company would just share price would just dive. <laughs> they got rubbish leadership at the top, you know, they're just not going to do well. So a lot of this stuff is not new, but it's been brought to the fore recently with people's ethical attitudes, because as we know, attitudes are all changing. People are you It's know, becoming more aware though, isn't it? Because hmm. things like this, like podcasts, you know, you've got people like Joe Rogan, you know, you've got that guy co- going on there talking about cobalt and Yeah. Well we're the like, generation that is picking up, frankly, a lot of the industrial um, mess hmm. that's being left behind. We are dealing with a, you know, climate crisis and it's become much more we're much more aware of it i think than frankly ever before because we're so plugged in we've got all the social media we've got all the news and everything else feeding us all the time all this data and therefore that is built into the investment side that i can now take into account frankly we've always taken it into account but we can take it more into account if people feel a particular way about investing their money mm. and therefore really tailoring their plan to them and that is something that you can look into yourself when you you know, set up an ISA, they will have an ethical portfolio if that's important to you. And you can look into that and what it's actually invested in. Yeah. So you can look into all those things. Yeah, my question with the ISA and investing was just around the sort of direction that the, obviously the market's gone in the last mm. couple of years. Mm. Is, is there, you know, is it still just good to get into to an investment ISA because the, the management team will make sure that the-, the You've got to believe that when, you've got to do your research. Yeah. Um, but when you put your money with someone, you've got to know that they have the managerial capability with your money to structure it in a way that it should outperform. Um, and you've got to track that over time. And sometimes you think, actually, they're just not that good. Yeah. And then you can adjust and either you can ring them up and have an argument about that with them. <laughs> um, or you can say, look, I'm going to go and go with someone else. Transfer yeah. me across to I'm going to open an ISA account with someone else. I'm going to go with them. That's your choice. It's your money at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So the market has not been great for the last few years. We know it's been very volatile. COVID and then the invasion of Ukraine and then also our chancellor at the time, Kwasi Kwarteng, coming out with some very misguided um, political statements um, that really rocked the market around heavily at Q4 last year. That has really meant for, for a very volatile market. I mean, people are saying to me, actually, the FTSE 100, you know, if you look at that on the news, that didn't do so badly in 2022, did it? Well, that's because it was so heavily weighted. It's a market capitalized index. So therefore, it's based on the size of the companies that it's got in it. And it was so heavily weighted towards oil, gas, energy, all these companies that suddenly shot off last year. And they didn't do too badly at all. But frankly, if you look at their performance before that, wasn't anything to write home about. Getting away with ripping people off, and they let's be let's be honest. You know? <laughs> another debate for another yeah, day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Just gotta get it in there. But that's that's <laughs> investing at the moment. So yes, it is a volatile market at the moment. But if you are again back to attitude, if you've got that attitude where you're thinking, hang on, you know, I've got to take that long term view with you know my health, my mental health, my financial health, I'm gonna take that long term view and build for my future because I know I've got it tomorrow you know, or at least you hope you've got it tomorrow, you know, I'm going to start putting these building blocks in place in all my parts of my life. And therefore, you look at the managers who's going to be managing your money. Does this guy have the qualifications, the accreditations, but also the know-how and the track record to manage my money in difficult situations? And frankly, the last three years have been a wake-up call for everyone um, because you it's really sorted the wheat from the chaff in the investment world as well because you've seen managers who you thought were perhaps quite good you know they came across and did all the presentation skills that you'd expect of them but frankly underneath were pretty light they have been sifted out so it's a much it's a very competitive market out there Um, so you know we are all out there to outperform for our clients but at the same time it's all about suitability and context and taking the right attitude to whatever risk they're prepared Mm -hmm. to take you know everyone wants maximum return Everyone wants no risk. And with all due respect, the world just ain't like that. You've got to compromise somewhere in the middle and find out what you're comfortable with. Yeah, 100%. Just while we're on mm. stock markets before we move on, what's mm. your, um, uh, I feel like I know what you're going to say already, but mm. I'm going to ask, what's your opinion on things like, uh, like pattern trading and that type of thing? 
Pattern trading. Well, it's a very, I mean, I'd, I'd just ask you, what are you hoping to achieve with it? And you'll say, mm, growth. Mm. And I'll just say to you, well, how does that fit in with the rest of your plan? Do you know the, do you understand what you're actually doing? Do you understand the risk you're taking? Do you need to take that risk? Um, what, what is, what is pattern trading? You can answer that one, Paul. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, like, like, it's, yeah. um, it's basically when you look at the stock market and particular stocks, mm. As people are buying and selling, the stocks kind of moves around, it goes up, down, and whatever else. Um, and there's a claim, and I don't know if it's true, that over a period of time, the the patterns in the market, so the buying and selling patterns of people, repeat themselves. Right. And because of the the, the barrier of entry is non-existent for for normal people to just go in and stop buying and selling, and. It's actually um, it's the regulation in this country. I think will you'll probably find stop you from doing that. It's actually quite a dangerous sort of area. But I mean, you can uh, sign up to a trading two one two account mm, with yeah. with proof of identification and start trading. And I think from what I gather, because of because of that, you get a lot of uneducated people in the market mm. who will spy and sell based on emotion, and that's predictable. And therefore, it you all can, comes back to you're taking a risk. Yeah. And I don't know if you fully understand that risk. And do you need to take that risk? But as well, when you talk about taking a risk, how much, how much, say you put a thousand pound in on a random stock and what, what are you really going to make on that? I don't even know. You know what I mean? Like how, what's, how yeah, exactly. Risk, what's your goal? Why would I risk that for, exactly. what, what, what for, is your goal? for 1,200 quid? You know, it, it seems stupid to me. Exactly. Especially you when don't I don't know, know what I'm on about. If you don't know where you're putting your money, <laughs> yeah. don't put it there. Yeah, simple as that. You've got to know where you're going. You've got to know who you're trusting here, and that is part of my job. We sit down. Is it like like you said before? Is it quality of company? Yes. So that's going to be there for longer. I mean, we do come better over a certain amount of time. You yeah, know. we come and back to a bad analogy. Quality is always going to perform. You know, um, if you have your Porsche, your Ferrari, whatever material thing, and this is a bit of a bad analogy because, well, as we know, vehicles are depreciating assets. But if you have your asset, be it Porsche or Ferrari, and the market changes its view tomorrow. And you spent hundred thousand for simple maths on that you know, Porsche or Ferrari, and it goes down to eighty thousand. You're thinking, oh, that was a terrible investment. I, I shouldn't have done that. All the rest of it. Don't panic. If it's quality, yeah, we'll go back up. it comes back, and that's the key. You're buying not for the short term. You know, one day, one week, one month view. You're buying, hopefully, for the rest of your time. You're buying quality. If you believe something is quality, it's going to be quality tomorrow. It's going to be quality in five years. It's going to be quality in 10 years. What you're trying to do is build a portfolio. And this is a key point. You know, you need to diversify. It's uh, something we're going to come and talk talk about later. You know, you need to diversify what you do. You've got your cash. You've got your savings. You've got your investments. You've got your property. Maybe you've got other little chattels as well, material things in life that are worth some value to you. You have not got all your eggs in one basket. And therefore you're taking, you know, your attitude of your long-term view is you're building your overall wealth to a position where you can get to that financial freedom, to that peace of mind. And it's all part of your plan. And that's what we say to people, you know, spread your assets, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I mean, there's another point, actually, we talked about ISIS, but the far more prominent one for actually people of our generation particularly is you've probably been employed uh, now for a good decade plus. And auto-enrollment, you know, you've been paying into a pension scheme through your employer and you need to find out what that pension scheme is, what it's worth, because that is a long-term savings plan. So don't beat yourself up and think, oh, I'm not saving anything, you know, and all the rest of it. You are, you just probably haven't realized it. You need to look at your pay slip and see what you're paying into your pension and then your employer should be able to give you details to go and look at that pension scheme and see what that's worth. Because that is a very important part of your plan when it comes to, yes, you can't touch it under current rules until you're 55. Um, but you know that is your long-term savings pension pot. And you should keep an eye on that and invest that because you can control the investments on that in a similar way to what you do with the rest of your stuff. Yeah, I, I haven't even got a pension. Mm. Who, well, you need to have a chat with. Have you, well, are you self-employed? I've been self-employed all my life. Mate. Well, you know, you need to have a think about, you know, this is a good yeah. way of tax efficiently. It's one of those things I've just never, I never, I never really think about it. Mm. And I'll probably do. Well, mm. definitely do. Yeah. But you know what I mean? We, this is a, it's a very good disciplined way of getting tax efficiently saving for the future. Yeah. Um, and therefore it's a good thing. It's a good thing. The regulator and the government came in with this some years ago to say, look, we should have an auto enrollment scheme. We should be telling people to take money out of your pay packet and save because people in this country are really bad as we know. A saving and it just gives them a little bit of something to fall back on because they might need it um, but you should address that if you're a more proactive individual and think 
I've got my cash flow right. I've got my savings and investments and ISAs. And then I've got my pension as well. Yeah. And when I get down to that stage later in life, that's going to be really good. And you can look at the investments for that. Make sure it's all appropriate to you. Yeah, it's a good point because I'm the opposite of Danny. I've pretty much always been in employment. So mm. I've been in the auto enrollment yeah. scheme. It's complete opposite. <laughs> in, in more ways than one. Um, but it's an interesting point because a few years back, I was auto enrolled with my employer. And what's what's the, uh, remind me of the minimum percentage? Well, it's, changed, make it's changed over the years, but at the moment, uh, you're putting in about it, 5%. It eight, and yeah. It's 8% overall. That's right, yeah. You know, you're putting in 5%, the employer's putting in 3%. But you need to have a chat with your employer, your HR and your payroll, because they might contribute more. If you contribute more, sometimes they'll match you. So it's exactly where I'm going with And it. if you've got that good cash flow, and you're thinking, actually, I'm doing really well, I've got promotion. You know, we're at the stage now where we're talking about, you know, we got the guy with the family he sorted the house he's gone to his mortgage broker he's got a house at a good rate which probably he's not doing right at this point in time but hopefully we'll see interest rates taper off in a year 18 months from when this was released you know he's done all those good things he's built himself a second level reserve he's now thinking actually how can i really develop my plan and therefore yeah auto enrollment is a very key thing he has a chat with his employer i've been getting promoted i've been doing really well i'm earning good thing can i contribute more to my pension scheme through auto enrollment so so will you match me yeah so to give an anecdote to that so the auto enrollment with my employer put me on five and my employer was on three percent so eight percent overall however as standard my employer offered up to six percent but because it was auto enrollment it only went five and three so I literally, just to your point, had to, but well, it was through a system, mm. but just adjust um, by by coming coming out of the auto enrollment and actually putting in like a contribution, mm. I then got an extra like, I think 4%. Exactly. Look at your cash flow. <laughs> That's but, mad, isn't it? Yeah. It, it comes back to it. Look at your cash flow. Look at what you can afford. You know, is your day-to-day living, you know, going to be affected by, because it will reduce your net earnings. It will reduce your take-home pay, but have a chat with your HR and payroll if you feel you're in a good position and start really, you know, pumping yeah. it in. But but it was weird because even though they they give up to six, it didn't automatically do that with the enrolment. Hmm. So I basically just had to go off of the auto enrolment, putting a contribution of still five, and then they matched it with five. Hmm. For example, I ended up putting in more. That's, but that's the sign of a good employer, hmm. uh, with all due respect, because that is a great benefit to your future and in your context and it's always important to look back at your context and your cash flow and everything else and make sure it's suitable for you that is a really good thing for your employers to do and it's a really good thing for people in general to look at because if you're employed um, then frankly it's a good thing to do you're getting tax efficient savings put away for the future with your case Danny um, you're self-employed so you now have to be more disciplined you're running your own business you're the director so you need to think to yourself about what is my earnings position? Can I afford with my cash flow to start setting up a pension? Because you get the tax relief at whatever tax rate you're paying to put it away for the future. And if you can afford to do it, it's worth thinking about. Yeah. Especially, I would argue, if you're earning over £50,000 and you're into the high rate tax brand um, under present rules. If you're, earning, if you're paying high rate tax and you can get 40% relief on what you put into a pension... That's a very good position to do. Because when you take it out, think about when you were 55, 60. Um, you know, maybe you retire at 65 and you decide to take your pension then. You'll take your tax-free cash under present rules, which is 25% of the pot. And then the rest of it goes into what's called, under current rules, a drawdown, potentially. And you can take an income from that and t- tailor that to your needs. You might be paying it in and getting 40% relief, but you might be taking it out and paying no tax or paying basic rate tax. So, you know, it's very tax-efficient is the point to do yeah. for your longer term plan and strengthens your overall plan. So it's all these things you need to think about. And these are, you know, as you go along the trigger points of life, you know, getting started, developing yourself, perhaps getting married, that's a trigger point because, you know, you're now trusting someone else with all of your financials and, you know, you're building a life together, buying a house. Again, another trigger point. You need to make sure that everything is tickety boo with that. And the next point I'd actually like to talk about is protection because it's the most overlooked thing by particularly men because we think we're completely indestructible and uh, we're, <laughs> we're never going to die and nothing's ever going to happen to us. But protection, I think, is, an, well, I know it's an undersold thing in this country, but it's a great help and I've seen the benefits of it. So I'm, I'm going to say, you know, how much do you guys know about protection? We had uh, Trevor Worth on. Yeah. He's come in and talked about estate planning and, and that Spoken sort of thing. Spoken eloquently about, yeah. Yeah. So we we have covered it to some extent, but he did say that he deals with will writing and mm. 
and that type of stuff and that he would typically partner with financial planners like yourself mm. in regard to that. So this is where also we come in to bring the holistic financial planning and I'll touch on that point actually because it's a good point and we do partner with people like this because we say to people, you know, you've had a trigger point, you've had a child, you've done your house, you've got some assets behind you, well done, you're doing a great job. Have you got a will? And if you haven't got a will, why haven't you got a will? Are you aware of what the laws of intestate actually say as to what will happen to you and your estate? And there's another really important here. What happens to the guardianship of your children? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what we... That was a we huge yeah. jaw-dropping yeah. moment for uh, us. This is, you know, this is why you need a will. You need to state all of those things. And it's very, very important. Then the other one that gets forgotten, frankly, is lasting power of attorney. Because, yes, you know, you might die. Very sad, you know, very sorry for you, but that's, you know, life. You might die and then the will comes into play. But what if you get hit by the bus? And with all respect, no one asks to ever be in Derriford. Shout out to the NHS because they do a fantastic job. But if you're in the hospital and you're not fully mentally compass mentors, you don't have capacity is what it's called anymore to make decisions. Who's going to make those decisions for you? And there's two types of lasting power attorney. And I'm sure Trevor will have spoken about this, but, you know, health and welfare. Who's going to make those decisions for your health and welfare? And who's going to make those decisions for your financial and property? And that is something we say, look, we don't do this. We're not legally qualified. But as your financial planners, we recommend as part of a strong overall plan, you get these legal documentations. You go and seek advice if need be. You go and seek advice, get these legal documentation done. Because if something goes wrong, it's better to have a plan um, and frankly, it be in place. Or frankly, if you don't have a plan and it's needed, you'll find that sadly you're leaving behind a bit of a problem for those you care about. Mm -hmm. So it's a really sobering thing I've seen happen a few times. Better to have a plan and not need it yeah. than <laughs> not yeah. have a plan. And, and, and Trevor talked yeah. about And Trevor will talk very eloquently about that, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, he, he, he talked about the number of occasions he's been in St. Luke's hospice, mm. you know, someone on their deathbed trying to sort this shit out and it's a little too late at that point. So, exactly. Yeah, it's really good advice. So these are trigger points as you go through life. You know, getting started, okay, fine. You know, you're building your life up. You're building your skill set. You're building who you are as a person so you can develop that and earn a living off it. The next stage, you know, we talked about, you know, getting yourself solidified, maybe getting married, maybe having kids, maybe getting a house. You know, all those things are trigger points then when you need to think about your wider legal situation because you've got assets. Well done you. You know, what a great situation to be in. And yes, life is full of challenges. This is another one. Go and get it sorted out. And then the next thing to think about is, frankly, protection. And you probably should have thought about this. You'll be prompted by this when you buy a house. If you talk to a proper mortgage advice broker, they will say to you, you've got a mortgage. What happens to you if you get critically ill or you die? And they will say to you, you can take out a policy at this cost, and they will do an assessment on your cash flow to make sure you can afford it, make sure it's suitable and appropriate for you. But it's worth considering. What's um, that insurance called where... Credit. Well, it's, it's more assurance because it's critical illness and whole of Critically, life. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's like it's life. They call it life and critical illness insurance, and it's one of the most important things if you've got a house. Because if you die and you leave a wife and two kids behind, how do you expect them to pay the mortgage? Yeah, it, I, uh, and this comes back to being a male, I think, because we are naturally, you know, by our medieval stance, hunter gatherers, providers, and all the rest of it. And you've got to sort of almost forget that and just think actually. If I'm out of the picture, what's going to happen to the people I care most about? Don't it, doesn't it pay it as well if you get a serious cancer or yeah? That's the critical. Yeah, that's the critical yeah, illness yeah. part. So that's can, the critical. Illness. Yeah, which is you know, going to going to happen to a lot of people, isn't it? Well, this is it. You know, the cancer rates are quite surprising, and I know you've had a medically qualified doctor or two on here to talk about these sort of things but you know it's really surprising and we do see a lot of claims and we I've personally assisted a few clients making claims and it's always very sobering when you do that. But I can tell you now, they are. <laughs> yes, it's an expense. You know, everyone hopes that the premium you pay for this policy will be a complete waste of your time in life. Everyone hopes you live a long, healthy life and don't need it. But sadly, the reality is, you know, if you don't look after yourself, if you let yourself, you know, get beaten up by your financial health, your mental health, and your physical health, and you don't do all those things, I mean, that cardiac uh, doctor you had on was very eloquent in the way he spoke about, you know, not realizing. Um, the importance of cardiac health and how we as males, you know, we put it off. We don't go and seek help on health matters. But these things all come to the fore when you go to claim. And it's very sobering. It was very sobering for me a few times going and doing the claim. But they were so glad 
They followed our advice, kept the policy running. Because there was a few times, actually, when we had conversations of cash flow. Oh, I'm going through a bit of a lean time at the moment. Can I cut this policy off? Uh, because I'd much prefer to pay for my Argyle season ticket. <laughs> and I said, as much as your Argyle season ticket is important, um, you know, this is more important, with all due respect. And, you know, you can refocus yourself with your attitude to make sure you go and get the money to do both. Um, you know, yes, you might be going through a lean time. We all have those in life. But you need to adjust your attitude and make sure that you've got appropriate protection in place so that if something happens to you, you're leaving behind a strong situation, not a weak situation. And that, I think, you know, for men particularly, that's something we, you know, yes, we put off because we like to believe we're, you know, invincible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've got to think about everyone else. And it's the same, men, women, you know, we've all got to you do it as a couple as well. You know, when you're a couple, you get married, you know, it's good prompt to think about protection and just what happens if I'm unable to work, that, you know, there are other forms of protection as well. There's income protection. So an income protection policy can come into place if you get too sick to work. I mean, we know that we've all got, you know, you're on your own, Danny. You know, you're a self-employed guy. It's very important for you because what happens if you're unable to work? You're basically relying on the benefit system at that point. <laughs> okay. Well, it's true. It, it, yeah, I mean, it's it, crazy, it, you don't have a great employer um, like, you know, Paul has and all the rest of it who will pay you a certain amount of time full pay maybe a certain amount of time half pay and then maybe assist with other matters as part of their overall package and this is something you should always check with your employer check what happens and if i'm unable to work because i get a serious event happened to me in my life i get critically ill you know how long are you going to pay me for you know because i've still got bills to pay you're going to pay me full pay for x amount of time half pay for Y amount of time. What is the situation here? So I know and I can plan and prepare myself and my attitude and my efforts and get appropriate so advice. I, I never even think of that. Yeah. yeah. I never even think of that. It's, it's, it's how you're going to provide for your family if something yeah. happens to you. It's just it's just the realities of things. And so. the thing is we talked earlier as well about, you know, sort of building up that safety net of like three, six, nine months. Mm. And we also talked about the fact that that could take you fucking years to do. Yeah. Imagine that just getting wiped out because you broke your leg. Exactly. Yeah. You know no, what I mean? All your yeah, career position that you've worked for all that time. Yeah, especially me being yeah. a personal trainer, you know, if I can't see my clients for six months, yeah. they've got to go elsewhere. Not yeah. because they you know want to, they're just because they got to. They've yeah. still, they've still got yeah. to carry on. And well, it, it, when you're an employed person, this is the, you know, the conversations you should have with your HR and payroll. What's my pension situation? What's my you know, other benefits that I get from being employed here? What's my sick pay situation? This all goes into your overall plan and your cash flow planning going forward for we talk about stress testing in my industry, stress testing your plan. What stresses have you really tested your plan against? Um, and this is where the peace of mind comes into it. If you know you've got a good plan that you've stress tested for some worst case scenarios, you're going to have good peace of mind. Mm -hmm. You're well on the way to part the path of financial freedom because you know that you've got a really strong situation. Hang on. You know, yes, I might you know, fall ill tomorrow, um, but I know my family's going to be all right. You know, I know everything I've built up so far. I'm going to have an income coming in. I've got appropriate policies in place to cover the mortgage. I've also got appropriate policies to come into place to cover my earnings because the bills ain't going to stop. You know, and that is all that can all be done cost effectively. It's not, you know, the whole job of a protection advisor, which is part of my job, actually, uh, is to assess your affordability. You know, they don't want to load you up with so many of these policies and premiums every month. It becomes like trying to pay off a car. Well, that's what I was yeah. about to say. Can, yeah. can regular people afford it? Well, yeah. this is it. You get you have to get yourself into a cash flow situation where you have that positive cash flow and you can afford it. But the, we're talking now about you know a person who's developing themselves, who's worked on themselves, who's built themselves into a good position, and they don't want to see it gone. Goodbye. Definitely. Yeah, okay? it's just so important. And then really leave is. behind a massive mess. Sadly, for everyone else, they might be like, oh, well, why didn't they do this for mm. you know, 40, 50 quid a month? I think you just, yeah. it, again, you, like what you said, we think we're invincible. We mm. think we're never going to get ill, never going to die, never going to do, you know, have an accident. Yeah. You know? yeah just but this is, this is the sort of job that I do as a financial planner and a wealth manager. You know, not only do I get the holistic plan really solidified for people on one page of paper, you know, you want to keep it simple. You want to know where everything you've got is on one piece of paper. But then you've got to think about actually the nitty gritty, what happens if X happens? What happens if Y happens? Am I prepared? You know, that's when you get real peace of mind and you know, actually I can take some hits here um, and I can remain calm. I'm not going to panic. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, yeah, it's good advice. Right, we're painting a good picture so far. So it's a positive picture. It's, it's good. Always a positive picture. You're filling me with hope, mate. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, so I, I saw this. This might be social media nonsense, right? So don't don't yeah quote me on this. But I saw something a while back, and it said not that you know many people have achieved this, but apparently the average multimillionaire has like seven streams of income. So we've talked a lot about you know sort of getting that cash flow from employment. Um, you know, maybe sort of then compounding that a little bit through sensible investing, protecting that 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 money. Are there any other strategies around creating other sources of income that you could talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we always I've touched on this already, but a diversified plan with your finances is always the best way to be. You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. That is an age old saying, and it is totally applicable to everything you should ever be doing. People talk about property investment. It's a and it's an investment that frankly has worked out very well for our parents generation. We are seeing policy at the moment coming through the government because of the tax debt uh, situation that our country is in, you know, they're going to start tightening the reins. Um, probably taxing people more. I mean, on you know property investment and other forms of investment like that, where frankly they could you know just get hold of you. Yeah. So that's you know, but that is another form of income. If you can afford to do that, fine. But don't overexpose yourself. Maintain your liquidity. You know, I've seen the amount of people I've seen who are asset rich and cash poor is alarming. You know, they may have many millions in property, but they can't afford to put the heating on. Um, is and that a situation? That is seen? a situation we've seen a few times, and <laughs> that comes back to you know your attitude of what you're actually trying to achieve here. What is your outcome? You know, some people get very, very um, property rich, and it's particularly true of our ge- parents' generation because they did very, very well you know, in the boom times. You know, we'd all love to have those boom times again, um, but sadly, the reality is I think it's going to be more difficult for our generation for all the reasons that we all know. Um, so yes, you should always try and diversify all your sources of income. But I think the best way that I've seen for some of my best clients um, and people I almost see as role models as well, if I look at them and as I see, you know, what have you done in your life that's made you so successful? The best people I've seen for diversifying their income run businesses. They are themselves directors like you, uh, Danny. You know, they run businesses and they have that leadership. Um, they've developed that leadership quality about them. And they run businesses because that is another source of income. That is your passive income. If you can develop yourself as a person that you have a skill set and then you can market that and set up your own business, that is a very strong position to be in. Probably the strongest. I mean, property is a good position. If you can afford to have lots of assets, wonderful, fantastic for you. Just keep it in perspective with the rest of your portfolio because you don't want to go overweight too much one thing. You don't want to have millions in property, find out you have loads of mortgages which are just complicating your mind. You can't write it all down on one page, so you're just complicating everything. That's going to have an effect on your mental health because you're going to be constantly going around being a bit stressed with everyone. Um, but you want to keep it simple. And the simpler you can keep it, yeah, property, fine. But if you can run your own business, that is some of our best clients have majored in that. But what they've also done is they've made it more of a lifestyle business. So you talk about passive income. They invest in this asset, which is their business, but they run it as more of a lifestyle thing. They've got their targeted employment, which they do, you know, and do very well, but then they're running other businesses. And that is something, if you if you can do that, that is a real wealth producer from what I've seen. What do you mean by lifestyle? Uh, well, literally, they don't have to. They've got someone in to manage it. They've right, built so. up the bit. Obviously, there's a hell of a lot of input yeah. in starting a business, as you guys will well know. You know, there's a lot of input you need to put in to build that business so that it gets to a point where you can then hire someone in to manage that business for you. And that, frankly, then almost runs itself. It's a really good saying um, I got told years ago is don't work in your business, work on your business. So instead of rather being, you know, when I add my shops and different stuff, a lot of the times I'll be in there working and you, you can't really see what you're doing from inside. You've got wood to pull it's wood from the tree out. stuff. Yeah. yeah. You've got to pull yourself out and then look at the business from the outside in. Hmm. The most successful clients I've got are those people who've been able to step back and just look wood from the trees. What are we trying to achieve here? What am I trying to achieve? Equally, they take the same attitude with us when we help them. They say, look, with all due respect, Simon, you know, you know what you know. Um, I'll just take your advice, but I can see that it looks sensible from the all the scripture you're giving me. You know, they are very good and very direct at what they do. And that's what I'd say to anyone looking at passive sources of income. Yes, property is a good one. If you can do property, if you've got the skills to maintain it and go in there at midnight when your tenant says the plumbing's split and all the rest of it and sort all that out, 
great. You know, some people absolutely love that. And I don't again that to anyone. Um, just be aware, though, it's very costly. Um, and cost is a key point with all of this process that you need to look at. You know, obviously, there are legal costs with property and everything else. But, you know, there's costs in everything. So if that works for you proportionally, great, another source of income. But if you can run your own business and do so successfully in a manner that you're talking about there where you can step back, let someone else manage the business, chip in when you need to, that is what some of my most successful clients um, financially, if that's what motivates you, not, not everyone's motivated by, you know, having loads of money. People just want to be positive and have that financial freedom in their own eyes, peace of mind. But if that's what motivates you, it gets you out of bed every day, it's a great thing to do. And that's what I've really seen successful people do. Yeah. So that's a good passive way of getting income because you're investing in an asset. You're effectively investing in yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes passive income becomes a bit of a false economy, doesn't it? Because mm. people think it's literally you do nothing can earn money. Yeah. Well, instead of you know, it's instead of, instead of act in investing, you know, in potentially liabilities that might detract from your situation, you're trying to look for assets. You're trying to look for things that over the longer period of time mm. will enhance your position rather than cause risk or yeah. potential harm. What are your thoughts on uh, investing in things like art and watches? Is that is that advisable? <sighs> Again. It's an unregulated market that we know most of our clients do because they have the spare income. They some of the some of these people, you know, find art extremely touching. They really connect with the um, you know feeling that it gives them, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but just be aware that you know it's only worth what someone will pay for it at the end of the day. My family got a little bit burnt with that. They bought the you know Lankovic paintings. They got a couple of originals and all sorts of stuff for the family, and then they've ended up. <laughs> just hitting hitting the floor over time and well and that's the way. risk you always take but you know if you're buying stuff like that you should really buy it because you enjoy it yeah that's exactly it, what it's to enhance really your care, lifestyle but. it's to enhance your life you're buying that because maybe it symbolizes something you know flag in the sand in your life i bought this watch because i got myself to a position where i was financially stable um you know i bought myself a rolex cool you know, good on you, you know, because you've worked yourself to that position where you have now decided, I need a flag in the sand. I need to reward myself. And everyone needs that in every part of their mm -hmm. life. They need to put a flag in the sand and figure out, I've come a long way. And that's yeah. key to your it's financial like plan. stones, isn't it? Yeah, because, you know, you need to see your efforts rewarded, I think, in life. Otherwise, you do start beating yourself up and go, why am I doing all this? Yeah, definitely. And is there is there anything else regarding sort of um, diversification and passive incomes that, that you would that you think is worth talking about? We've obviously talked about property, we've um, just touched on, you know, sort of small assets and that type of thing, and obviously talked about running businesses. Is um, there anything if else? You're, if you're building up a sizable portfolio in your pension, because you're auto enrollment, because you're contributing what you can afford to do there, cash flow wise, if you're building up a good size ISA portfolio, because you can put 20,000 pounds at present rules into an ISA every year, you know, if you can build up a portfolio there and keep diversifying your assets, don't, you know, let them, be too concentrated on where they're investing your money make sure they spread it out you know you need to take a global an asian a u.s view with your money be global be diversified make sure they're not investing all in one place or too heavily in one place so always watch the costs as well because costs over time will massively detract from your overall outcome if you're doing all of that and you're measuring your risk in your context and suitability you're doing about everything you can and frankly that's all the guidance that you can be given. If you need advice, you should definitely seek it out because if it gets too much for you, you're probably, you're not keeping it simple. If you are adding loads of money though, and you're in this really strong position, is it really a bad thing just to put the money in the bank? Some people are comfortable. Some people are comfortable with that. At the end of the day, it's all your money. Yeah, that's it's your I mean. decision. Like, is, it, is it such a bad thing? You hear about it all the time oh, about investing, doing this and that. Is it such a bad thing just to go, well, right, you, got, you know, it's my you've money? You've got to think about it. Is it staying competitive with, you know, with where the world is at the moment? If inflation stays sticky at 10.1%, 10.5%, or, you know, if we believe true inflation, 16%, 19%, um, you know, is your money really going to keep up? Yes. You know, you're yeah. losing the buying power of your money by not letting it work harder for you. And that's all I'd say to you. You got to, if you're comfortable with that, fine, because it's your money at the end of the day. Yeah. But you've got to think context. You've got to think suitability. You've got to think long-term goal. And that's what we always say to our clients. You know, is this really suitable given your goal is here? You know, you could end up here. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, are you really comfortable with your money not working harder for you in a risk-related way? Yeah, it does make sense. We touched on it earlier, didn't we? But 
Because I think with banks at the moment, even like an e- easy access saving account, the mm. most you're going to get is probably, what, 5%? Yeah, and that's if you, you know, some of them have rules think, around that, yeah. Yeah, and then you think about like inflation and you can see how it pulls apart. To yeah, your well, hopefully, we, we, we live in hope that inflation, you know, this is a temporary inflationary environment where hopefully it'll taper off rather quickly. And they were saying, the government's aim was, I think, t- inflation would half by Christmas. Um yeah. You know, we can have some bets around the table about whether that will happen. Um, yeah. You know, I wanted to ask like what what hit, what history has shown us in regard to these sort of situations. Like, what, where do you think? Well, there, you take there have been guess? inflation spikes. I mean, the last you know, my father he talks. You know, he's been in the industry thirty years, and he was twenty years an army officer before that. You know, he talks about inflation uh, running in the teens uh, and interest rates. Sorry, running in the teens. Um, those were hard times to get a mortgage. He says, you think, you know, this is expensive for your mortgage assignment. With all due respect, you, you, don't, you don't know nothing yet. Um, they had serious inflation back in the 70s, 80s, et cetera. So, Speaking to one of my and, clients and his dad, um, he was rates, saying yeah. when they were kids, they, his dad, they ended up losing their house because mm. of just the, inf- the inflation went up by 10% or something. And the interest rates the and all the rest of it, when it starts moving. And they moving, physically couldn't afford to just pay their mortgage where they were comfortable mm. for five years. Boom went up to like we said like seventeen eighteen percent. Well, yeah, inflation affects the cost of lending. Interest rates, you know, affect the cost of your mortgage and your borrowing, yeah. and your debt. And with all due respect, if that starts rocketing away, like we're seeing at the moment, the Bank of England and you know the Fed raising rates at almost well, pretty much record rates. So what, what causes that though? Well, that's just the the way of the. That's their blunt instrument to try and control and quell the rate of inflation in our economy. And there's deep arguments in my industry about whether it actually works and the effectiveness of it. But it's, a, it's like taking a hammer, um, basically, to the situation. They just believe that that will calm the economy down, calm down the inflation, and we will return to what they regard as a normality. Um, hopefully, we will. What, by squeezing people? Yes. Because that literally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, is, is anything, because, you know... I'm just trying to understand it. Yeah, I, I, I think about, like, post-World War One Germany and hyperinflation, mm. when you had people, like, with wheelbarrows of cash buying <laughs> loaves of bread. Like, I don't think we're heading there, well, but... Hopefully we're not heading there. That, that no. would be, that would be um, frankly, that would be a situation that's completely alien for this country. Yeah. I mean, I think we should, you know, take credit that we're, you know, we're living in a very, very solid, good country. It's a, pr- it's a pleasure to live here. And the more you travel, the more you realise we've got it good here. So we just need to adjust ourselves yeah. to the environment and adapt. Yeah, we've, we've had, a, you know, it's, 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 it's good to hear that because we've had a couple of people, like Ricky and Mark mentioned it, I think, about travelling and, and mm. perspective. Mm. Because it's so easy, isn't it, to be wrapped up in this country's economy at the moment and just think it's a fucking disaster and that we've got it so bad. But relatively speaking, it's still, as you say, pretty good. We all love a good moan in this country. Yeah. But I can tell you now, um, from everything I'm seeing, the outlook is extremely positive. Yeah. And therefore, you know, when you started off with that question, you know, should we give up or are we, pardon me, just fucked? Yeah. We're not just fucked. No, we just need to adapt and frankly, we will be all right. And you need to start chipping away. Because if you are in that position where you're suffering right now, you need to start chipping away and just building this continuous process for yourself of getting on top of where you're at. Yeah. And your situation will improve. Yeah. It's going to be hard work, but, you know. Yeah, it's mad though, isn't it? Like, we have got it good. We have yeah. got it good. I think Jordan Peterson was saying the other day that if you earn $30,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of earners in the, in the world. Yeah. Which, uh, when, I, when I heard that, I was like... Really? And then you look at it, you think, fucking hell, how lucky are we? Well, this is why we're so how well respected lucky we, around the know? world. Our, with all due respect to our regulator, they do an excellent job of trying to protect the consumer and the client. You know, we have got weights and measures in place to try and do the best we can, but the market is not a controllable thing. Um, so therefore, we always have to take that on board when we look at our situations and go, what can we do? What are we comfortable with? What are we trying to actually get as an outcome here? Let's be reasonable. Let's prepare our minds and our attitudes so we're not beating ourselves up, downing our mental health, and then downing our health as a product of that. Um, you know, so. Yeah, mad. All right, well, that's good. Okay, so we've survived the cost of living crisis. Mm. I'm now 20 years older and I want to fucking retire. Mm-hmm. How do I do that? What, what does that even mean? Well, what does that even mean? I mean, you get to that point and you think again, this is a trigger point. And we always say to people, this is a great time to review because all of your, you've been in an accumulation phase of your life uh, till then. You've been trying to accumulate wealth, trying to build everything you do, positive cash flow, accumulate, save, and all the rest of it. You're then changing your entire view 
to, with all due respect, an almost decumulation in some cases, because you have a way you want to live your lifestyle. And therefore, there comes a decision point where you have to think, actually, what income do I need in retirement to retire? Can I afford to retire? Um, and this is quite a sobering point for some people. Some people don't even want to retire because they think, actually, if I stop working, it will affect my mental health so much because I won't have purpose. And this is something we understand as men. You've got to have purpose. Um, that they actually go to what's called, uh, I heard recently, a twat. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They just reduce their hours. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, a twat. Um, uh, so they become a twat, um, quite literally. Um, and because that, for their mental health and their mindset, is much better. They have the purpose of getting up a few days a week. You know, they have long weekends. You know, and that for them is more important about lifestyle. They're still earning some money. They're not so worried. So you need to assess and have a decision point about what income do you need? What is, first of all, what does retirement mean for you? What income do you need? But also what capital do you need behind you to sleep well at night? And this is something we talk to our clients about along with, you know, the three key points, you know, your income tax situation, your capital gains tax situation, and you're getting to the stage with all due respect, you should start thinking about your inheritance tax situation because you've built up some assets. You might have an inheritance tax situation that you might need to address slowly over time as part of your plan because your plan takes a different point, a uh, different uh, you know, path at this point. You're all about producing income, making your money work harder. Um, and that's where we really get involved with our clients to discuss this, um, you know, to really figure out you know, what can your money produce for you uh, tax efficiently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the next stage. That's, yeah. you know, where you really realize actually all my hard efforts, have they got me to this point of, you know, the path to financial freedom? Have I really got peace of mind to the point where I can now retire? What's the fruit of my labor? If you are in a position where you might have your house bought because you've been self-employed mm. and you go to retire you look well you're looking to retire maybe coming up to 60 mm. you haven't really got a very good pension mm. is there any sort of thing that you would recommend and maybe they got four or five more years of a fairly good income is there something that they could put it into sorry what, what, what do you mean by you got your house bought and bought and paid for you mean bought and paid for house bought and paid for yeah come in up to your 60s yep. just thinking of like a scenario for someone yeah maybe they haven't got the best pension in the world because they've been self-employed they put all their money into their house then they're looking and thinking you know, shit, I haven't got a great pension. At that point, is there something maybe that they could do to, to downsize? Well, yeah, I mean, you've or... always got to remember as well, um, and this is something that's quite important for self-employed people, you've got to check that you've been paying your national insurance contributions mm -hmm. because that builds up your uh, entitlement to the state pension, which actually in today's terms, and I know this because my dad started claiming it, um, it's Can not they? insignificant. You know, it's over 10 grand a year. Uh, now, it? yeah, is that even still a thing though? Yeah, stay pension is still a thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Okay. And this, for most perhaps. people, forms a really everyone good gets a state pension as well. As long as you're paying national insurance contributions at the present rules, they say 35 years of national insurance contributions to claim the full state pension. That is a really great starting point for your retirement, and you got to obviously reach the retirement pension age or whatever that will be at that the time keep, that keeps going on every yeah, year yeah that keeps it? coming up by the time we get there guys it'll probably be you know, 75 80 <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it all depends on the, probably what they can afford and the debt yeah, situation of yeah. our country but um at the same time you know it's, it's a really strong it's a strengthener to your plan you know so if you're in that situation where you're asset rich technically what can, is it what is the retirement age now 67 well they, so. yeah they said 67 60 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no i just didn't i couldn't remember i thought it was 67 yeah but the, they'll write to you and you can actually do what's called a br19 state pension forecast um to see your national insurance you can log on to the government gateway portal and this is something i actually encourage people to do actually if you're young or old because you can log on to the government gateway portal and you can check your national insurance contributions it's a good thing to do actually just to make sure that your payroll is being processed properly mm -hmm. And then you know that, frankly, you know, for the future, you're doing all the right things you should do. So log on to the Government Gateway Portal, have a look at what your national insurance co contributions are being logged as, because they should be logged. And then you can just check that you're doing all the right things as you go along. But at, at this late stage where you're at now, where you're thinking, I'm getting close to retirement, I don't know how much more work I can stick in my life. Um, yeah, I think I'll just, uh, you need to check the BR19. Do a BR19 state pension forecast. It'll tell you in today's terms, you're due a pension um, of X, Y, and Z, which is the full state pension because well done. You've worked for 35 years and we've got that record on of you on the system. Um, but that is due on your, you know, this date on whatever, which might be your birthday when you're 67 or whatever. They will tell you when it's due. And that is the key point. And then you know from that date, 
I will be getting my state pension. And that starts my plan off. I will be on, in today's terms, roughly about £10,000 a year, depending on your contribution levels you know, as a starter. And that helps a lot of people. Well, yeah, that covers most essentials. Well, exactly. It's, you know, it, you it's, it's not a lot, but it's mm. equally not to be sneezed at. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Well, it's, it's a contribution. But I think, I feel like this is, this is why I asked. I, I, this, you know, this is one, I guess I probably come across a little bit ignorant in regard to like the pension situation because obviously the, the auto enrollment and the need now to pay into your own pension. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I, I partly assumed it was gone but it's probably my 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 dad just chatting <laughs> no, <laughs> conspiracies no, no, but it's definitely still there but it's just yeah it just seems like it must be a lot less now than it used to be perhaps right because it, it feels like you probably it's probably not enough to live on in today's terms and that's why you need the state pension was never designed to be a complete one size you know solves all mm. um, it was designed to complement the plan of people who had worked their entire lives and contributed to the system which is you know we all respect we all moan about paying tax mm. but someone needs to fund this great society that we live in mm. and therefore you know you suck it up and you get on with it yeah. um, and therefore this is effectively just society giving back to you and complementing your plan so you're not in poverty in retirement that was the whole idea of the state pension so no it's it's not going anywhere from what i can see on the policy side um, but it is a very good strengthener to people's financial plans at that stage. Um, but if you're getting to that stage and you're in that situation where you're asset rich and cash poor, you should probably seek advice um, as to what your situation is. And frankly, you know, consider accordingly what yeah, like someone says to you. Because it's all down to context and there might be a number of other factors going on in their lives. Um, you know, and as a regulated professional, you have to know your client. You have to do a fact find on them. You need to really, it's like with you guys, you know, when you do your fitness, fitness training and everything else, you really get to know your client. You really get to know their ins and outs. Get what they're saying, you know, in context, everything in context, and then make a suitable plan for them. That is the key point of everything that we do in the industry. And, and someone in that situation really does need to seek some advice. Mm-hmm. Um, Because there might be some things that they've missed. There might be some benefits they could claim with all respect, universal credits, etc., pension credits. And all those things need to be investigated to, frankly, help them recover their plan so that they can potentially retire. Mm -hmm. Or just know the situation and carry on. Be balanced. So if someone um, maybe has done quite well in life and they they want to retire a little bit sooner than, you know, the, the government stated age of retirement, is there like a general rule of thumb in regard to you know, sort of wealth that you would normally sort of suggest when someone... It all comes back to that argument of how much income. What does retirement mean for you? How much income do you need to live off? How much capital do you want behind you to make sure that if something goes wrong, if you need care later on? If you've got a strong income, normally, you know, you can afford... I mean, care is an incredible cost. I mean, Mm -hmm. we've got a lot of clients actually who are, well, a significant number who are in care or, you know, about to receive care and the costs associated with that. And it's a very real thing for, I think, our generation, our parents' generation as they approach this age now. Um, The care costs can be incredible. And therefore, you've got to have a consideration of what income do I need to retire? What capital do I need behind me? You know, and also on top of that, if I'm of that way, what do I want to leave behind for my children? You need to plan accordingly. Um, So that's where it really comes down to. Um, on that point, you need to have that discussion with yourself. What do I need to live off? You know, 50 grand a year, 60 grand a year. That'd be nice, you know, lovely. But what do I need to do? What what assets do I need to save to really produce that level of income? And that's where you come in with all due respect, talk to a regulated financial advisor, um, someone with my background and accreditations, and they just say to you, this is your plan. This is where you're at. There is a gap. Therefore, or well done you, You're, you're at that situation already. You can retire tomorrow. Great. Hey, well, so that's words we all like to hear, Fucking right? Well, great chat. That yeah. would be nice. <laughs> but that's it. It's just, it's just, yeah. You have that chat with a regulated professional, and they will tell you your situation um, in black and white, and you can just take it. Right. Okay. Either I can crack on, or I know where I got to go. And sometimes everyone needs that check. It's another trigger point in life. You know, if you're thinking about you're getting to the age where I don't know how much work I can stomach, or generally I just want to retire. I just want to live some more life. You know, I've been putting in the hours for a long time now. And some people just want to do more lifestyle, yeah. you know, readdress the balance. And they just say to us, you know, can I afford this? And we say to them, look, here's where your figures are. This is what we can do for you. What do you think? Mm. What are you comfortable with? What's the discussion here? What's the outputs? And also, 
stress test. What if your kids come back to you and ask for a bit of money? You know, this is another conversation. (laughs) Well, this is it. You know, they come back and say, you know, dad, mum, you know, you obviously want to help your children in life, Mm. you know, deposits for houses, um, you know, help with any marriage situations that might occur, um, you know, help with the grandchildren. Um, These are all things you need to factor into your financial plan when you stress test in life. These are all life events and all trigger points for you. So we as professionals address all this with cash flow forecasting and say, look, this is the worst case scenario. This is the best case scenario. You could end up somewhere in the middle. Um, and how do you feel about that? And they will come back and go, yeah, that's fine by me. Or actually, I need to still keep working. You've just given me the motivation I needed. I will adjust my attitude, readdress my efforts. And frankly, there's my outcome. Thank you for clarifying for me. Yeah. yeah so that's that's where you get to um, with all of that. Yeah, with um, just, just a go sideways slightly it, mm. with, you just touched on obviously kids and education and mm. marriages and that sort of stuff so you know Danny and I are parents so we've maybe got to consider these things um, thinking about that and thinking about a sort of long term plan you know would you would you recommend things like creating like trust funds for like a wedding for university fees and then just sort of pay into them and keep them over there or would you think it's better than just keeping things i know you talked about diversification honestly already. this all comes back to context uh, at the end of the day and it all really does come back to um because you, know, you can give guidance and all information because those things are all very nice to do mm. but if your context of your situation is such that potentially putting that thing those assets to one side would hinder your long-term plan yeah. with all due respect if you're in a strong position yourself you know, your children will end up in a strong position because you will have the assets behind you, the income to help them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, it's better to help as you go along rather than just give people lumps of cash. Um, So, you know, you've got to have that debate with yourself. You've got to put that in context of your overall plan and whether you think that's suitable to be doing that. Um, Because sometimes it's better to have, you know, control of the money yourself for whatever situation you might come up with or frankly it might be better that you yeah look at the gifting aspects but there are other ways you can look at doing it mm. yeah all right perfect uh that, that's summarized then so i think really first of all really appreciate you coming in mate that's been some really good messaging i think for our audience you know it, it is about creating i guess a, a bit of a framework in regard to how they can self-develop and improve their situation um and ultimately their mindset and everything else mm. and i think we've done a great job of, of basically starting at the very beginning for some people mm. where we've talked about um you know sort of getting into employment improving your skill set your knowledge and then working your way up into a position where you've got you know a fairly okay income mm. You pair that with then maybe a bit of an analysis or an audit of your finances, your outgoings, and you can find that positive cash balance. Mm. And then from there, we've obviously talked about how you can then sort of protect that and build on that. So mm. so thank you. I think we've done a really good job. No, that's um, great. All I'd say is it's all about trigger points all the way through your life. You know, the first trigger point is getting yourself educated. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a bright person or not. With all due respect, apprenticeships are a very good line for a lot of people. You develop your skill set however you can. And then you move on from there to the next trigger point, which is solidifying yourself and your position. And then, of course, we end up at the position where you're probably potentially going to need to seek advice. Um, frankly, you can seek advice as early as you want. People will always help you. And there is advice out there. And there's a lot of resources out there. I mean, I, I talked about the Citizens Advice Bureau. They're always a good place for people to go at any stage of their development and get the information that they need and some guidance. Again, they will not necessarily give you advice, but they will give you a lot of good guidance and they're a very good service. So I'd tell people to look at that. I'd also tell people to look at the Martin Lewis uh, releases on YouTube, etc., Uh, because he does have some very good prompt points on information that you should consider, again, in the context of your situation. Context is always very important and suitability for you. You've got to make sure everything fits with your plan and bespoke it to yourself. Otherwise, frankly, it's going to end up being pretty meaningless. Um, The other point is, you know, if you are seeking advice from a regulated financial plan, a shameless plug time now, um, you know, there are places where you can search them out as well. The FCA has a very good part of their website where you can actually look up uh, advisors um, and you know there's the FCA register so if you think someone's you know you're talking to someone and this guy's claiming to be a FCA regulated financial advisor you can actually look them up oh we're all online we're all on a register um, and that's how you can confirm our regulated authorized status um, and also what permissions we have to give you 
inf uh, reg uh, regulated information in specific areas because there are specific areas of advice. So you can check all that on the FCA's uh, register website. You can also look up on the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment website where there might be a regulated uh, financial planner or wealth manager in your area. And I would encourage you to do that if you're thinking about any need for advice that you might have. Because, you know, we've talked about information. Information is out there. There's a lot of YouTube channels. They prompt you and give you those trigger points to consider at times in your life what you need to be thinking about. And I would encourage you to look at those. But then there's guidance and then there's advice. Advice is where you can really get some help and you need that advice to add value to your overall situation so you can get your path to financial freedom really sorted and get your peace of mind. There's also websites and YouTube channels where people talk about a lot of stuff. I was just going to briefly touch and say, look, these YouTube channels where they're coming out and saying, do crypto, do all mm -hmm. this, with all due respect, it's not going to be suitable for a lot of people, but you've got to make the decision with your own money. Mm -hmm. um, but also take note, and there's all lots of information out there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of guidance, but when it comes to advice, seek out a regulated professional, get the right advice at the right time, and this goes for all aspects of your life. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, yeah. The only thing I would add, literally, is just say to them, you know, with all due respect, you need to watch through the podcast that you guys have created because yeah. they raise some really good points about attitude. Yeah. Um, and about developing yourself as an individual, and yeah. that leads on to, with all due respect, your financial health. Yeah, no, that's good advice, mate. And I think one of the dangers of the wonderful world that we live in these days is that there's so much free information out there online, isn't there? Mm. And we've talked about this in the fitness industry as well. Is that there's sadly, don't believe everything you see on social yeah. media. It's, you've got to take everything in context. Frankly, there are a hell of a lot of scams out there. <laughs> they will lead you down the garden path and bury you, and you don't want to be that person. And everyone's sorry when it happens, but you can prevent that by just putting everything in your context and taking suitable advice, and the help is out there. Yeah, 100%. And it was something that Trev um, from Port Carlos talked about on his episode mm. regarding will writing, mm. that, that's not regulated, and essentially people can be a will writer mm. without any... You know, he correct used to training. Come out of prison, didn't he? he yeah, could yeah. literally come out of prison and then start yeah. a real business. Which so was I think, so I think the advice to actually look at the registers and see. Well, I think at the same time as well, sometimes you get what you pay for in life. You do. And if you're going to seek out the help, you've got to seek More out the right help. But if you're going to seek out, you know, someone's opinion, like you would seek from a financial planner, and you're asking someone to look at you objectively, you know, really get to know you, and then frankly help you form an outcome so that you can adjust your attitude, your efforts, and your m mindset. And, get that outcome you know yes you're going to pay a fee for that yeah. but sometimes you get you should get what you pay for yeah the, that person should add value oh. and that's the key point to look for yeah i agree that so much in life and even if someone so it isn't a scam they might just be shit <laughs> because they've not got the right <laughs> well, training you've also got to get on with them in life and if you just don't get on with them then it's a non-starter isn't it yeah 100 percent. awesome mate i think we're done thank you so much thanks for very much on. for having me in guys yeah, it's been a pleasure it. thanks Legend. thanks cheers mate, mate. Thank cheers you. danny cheers mate